put something like 20th Century Boy on now, and that, that first dynamic chord that comes in, and it sounds as fresh as the day it was recorded. It was cool to be Kemp. It was great to wear makeup. Here's a guy who was coming to school on a daily basis in a handmade suit. You can still almost reach out and touch that record. Do you know what I mean? You can still hear the party going on in the studio. Paul Sexton here, and welcome to 20th Century Boy, an appreciation of Mark Boland. This is an updated version of a program I made for Radio 2 in 2007 about the star who put the glam in glamorous, the boy from Hackney who was a solo mod, then a hippie with Tyrannosaurus Rex, then finally became the face of early 70s glam pop at the helm of T-Rex. It's 36 years now since we lost Mark at the dreadfully early age of 29 when he was killed in a car crash in London. In September 2013, he would have turned 66 years old. Over the next hour, we have an A-list of friends, family, collaborators and devotees dropping in with their memories of Mark. And I've added a few extra sound bites from him and about him from the new six-disc Bolan at the BBC box set. So we'll be taking a look at the Bolan legacy with the help of Noel Gallagher, David Gilmour and Rick Wright from Pink Floyd, Roy Wood and Mark's family, his partner Gloria Jones, brother Harry Feld and son Roland Bolan. And personal friends such as longtime producer Tony Visconti, David Bowie and first Bernie Taupin. If you read the stories of his background and the people that he grew up with, everybody, the one thing they say about him is that, and it's said about a lot of people who become major stars, but there are those elements of people, there are two sorts, there are the people that don't set out to want to be successful, but they just become successful. You know, they want to create, but they don't say, I want to be a huge star, where there are those elements that actually say, I'm going to be a huge star. One day you're going to see my name in lights. Mark was consistently like that in his youth. He said, I'm going to be a huge star. I think with that sort of belief in your own artistic merit, you have a good chance of doing it, whether or not you are as good as you think you are. I'm uh, Mark Patris, and I'm the author of Bolan, The Rise and Fall of 20th Century Superstar. Everything to Bolin was drama and he saw himself as this little star when he was eight years old on the streets of Hackney. He really, really believed that and you can see him on top of the pop sometimes and the way he smiles at the camera sort of knowingly that he's kind of there. He's just, very, his self-awareness there is so strong. Whether he was in the public eye or whether he's not, Bolin intrinsically was a star whereas I don't think you can say the same about Bono or J-Lo, you know, contemporary kind of people. I think he really had that magic and drawn to pop music in that there was nowhere else for him really to go. I was dancing when I was twelve I was dancing when I was twelve I was dancing when I was out I was dancing when I was out I danced myself right out the room Dance myself right at the wound. Is it strange to dance so soon? I dance myself right at the wound. Mark Feld was born on September the 30th, 1947, into the austerity of post-war London. 
foreign holidays and pleasure motoring were banned. The meat ration was cut to a shilling's worth per week. Father Sid drove lorries. Mother Phyllis would later work at a fruit store. But 1947 was also the peak of the baby boom, and Mark's brother Harry, who was older than him by two years, recalls that 25 Stoke Newington Common was a happy home. Our family was very close-knit. There's only the four of us, Mum and Dad, Mark and myself. Mum and Dad was our base. Mark was the kind of character who would not be stopped. If he was knocked down, he was like the, the little dolls with the round bottom. He'd bob up again and he'd say, well, we'll have to take a different road and sort out the problem from there. He was very determined. I dance myself into the tomb. In those days, there used to be a paper called the Sunday Pictorial and on the back page is like a bargain basement. They're all new stuff, but you could pay weekly. It was about nine. My mum and dad bought an acoustic guitar. I think it was about £11, which is a lot of money then. That was his first instrument. Did he have lessons at all? No, he, Mark was completely self-taught. I think the only time he had a couple of lessons was when he went from acoustic to electric, and Eric Clapton helped him out with some tips on how to play an electric guitar. I dance myself out of the room. He used to go down to the Hackney Empire, see when it was uh, Oh Boy shows and that, and uh, what he used to do is go down there and try and educate himself in how he would progress once he got old enough to do it, because he was only nine, ten at the time. Because he was a fan himself, he adored Elvis, but he also adored Cliff Richard. To him, Cliff was kind of a, a, a unique, unusual character, you know, had a, a, exoticism, early Cliff, with his greased back hair, you know, the British Elvis. So he knew what it was like to be a fan and to worship someone, because he understood that. I think that's why he almost wanted to make himself this ultra, ultra star. <laughs> Mark supplemented his listening diet of English rock and roll with the American originals by Elvis, Chuck Berry and more. I remember seeing little Richard put his foot on the piano and that felt very um, outrageous then actually. And Eddie Cochran, the way he held his guitar and moved, looked good, you know. And um, that definitely influenced me incredibly. But I think Elvis was a man. I mean, uh, films like Loving You. And, uh, I mean, because he really used to wiggle his bum, you know? A school pal of Mark's in North London would go on to become one of today's most successful celebrity photographers, Richard Young. I got to know Mark when I was about age 11. We were thrust together in a secondary modern school in, in Stoke Newington called William Wordsworth. We sat close together in each class as we progressed through the four years that we um, were allowed to stay there. He left about the age of 14 because his family moved down to Wimbledon. And I left at 14 and a half because um, I don't think the school wanted me there anymore. This guy was a total individualist. He, he was a, t a total face, as, as we were called, or they were called in those days. And we always used to hang around Stanford Hill in an amusement arcade called Stip, which is a Yiddish word, I think, where all the guys would collect outside the Stip and their, you know, Vespa GSs. And then they would make off to the clubs, either local or into Soho. And in those days, which was around about 1961, 62, um, there was places like the Flamingo, there was a Whiskey A Go-Go, and there was the Establishment and places like that, and everybody used to go there. You know, we, don't forget, we were only, what, 11, 12, 13, and here's a guy who was coming to school on a daily basis in a handmade suit, in handmade shoes, and beautiful John Michael four guinea royal shirts with the fly front. Just the most immaculate kid. His dad was a lorry driver. I never met his dad. I met his mum because his mother was working like maybe half a dozen stalls down from my dad in um, Berwick Street Market. You know, she had a, a fruit store and my, my dad was selling ladies hosiery. And uh, we used to play truant nearly every Friday because it wasn't cool for us to go and play games with the rest of the school. And, well, you don't expect some kid to run around a sports field, you know, playing football in a handmade suit. So we would play truant, get on the 73 bus in Stoke Newton and go to the West End, to Soho. And then we would end up in 
um, Old Compton Street, looking in the shop windows, seeing what the latest thing was. Maybe in Sportique or John Michael, and then maybe go and have a coffee in somewhere like the Two Eyes or something. Mark's later partner, Gloria Jones. He shared so many wonderful things with me, personal things. For instance, when he was um, 14 or 15, he loved fine clothes, so he had a wonderful suit tailored and his shoes were made. The guys were jealous of him. They had planned to beat him up. So he, when he went to the dance, he said, oh, my God. He said, there they are. So he said what he did, he went into the men's room and went out the window. Because he, he did not want them to destroy his clothes. He was no good at anything at school. He hated school. The sooner he could get out, the better. And I believe in the end, the school and him come to an arrangement. And he just went his own way. Oh, I love that phrase. Ah, oh, Feld, we've come to an arrangement. But even if he did hate school, Mark Feld definitely had a flair for the English language. Here's his later manager, Simon Napier-Bell. Mark had a, an extraordinary imagination. He, he didn't really live in the real world at all. He saw everything around him in a poetic fantasy way. Buses, people, buildings. He could look at the city around him and pretend he was somewhere completely different, a, a forest or another planet. When I asked him where he lived, he described this extraordinary home, which sounded like something between an Eskimo's igloo and a, a hut in the Amazon jungle. In fact, it was a small prefab in Wimbledon where his parents had lived for 15 years. Wicked was the fangled tang that shadowed whole the moon. The hours of horse were soon unhorsed. The face of war, the spider spore, a door of tyrant skin, was wide beside the foamy tide of scale the scholar king. By 1965, Bob Dylan had made his mark on Mark, both musically and politically. The 17-year-old Feld attended the big C&D rally of that year, and he flirted with different performing names as well. He was Riggs for a while, named after a friend of his, and then Toby Tyler. But before his first single release at the end of 1965, he changed it again, possibly inspired by his friendship with the actor James Bolam, or maybe not, says Brother Harry. There's two different stories. Mark was always a great follower of Bob Dylan. Where if you look at his Bob Dylan, it's B.O. from Bob and L.A.N. from Dylan. I think James got a bit upset because he thought that he'd used his surname, but it wasn't Bolam, it was Bolan. And to back that up, the first two references to him in the New Musical Express in late 65 both call him Mark with a K, Bolam with an M. Simon remembers his first encounter with a would-be superstar. I was sitting at home one day about 7.30 in the evening when someone phoned me and said, my name's Mark Bolam, I'm going to be the biggest star in the world. Could I send you a tape for you to listen to? I said sure and foolishly gave him my home address. And then ten minutes later there was a knock on the door and when I opened it, I saw this strange Dickensian urchin. He had a tattered jacket and a school cap and a guitar slung over his back. Actually, he told me, I don't have a tape, but I could play some songs for it if you like. Well, I let him in the sitting room. I guess I was just trying to test his self-confidence. I said, go on then, be quick. Uh, he, he chose my biggest armchair and climbed into it, sitting cross-legged in it like a, like a little pixie. And off he went. He couldn't play the guitar very well at all. He used a capo to help him get the, the difficult chords and he was very adept with it, probably better at the capo than he was at the guitar. Sometimes right in the middle of a song he'd make, make a one bar break, sort of tap the guitar with his, with his hand to keep the rhythm and speak or sing something. And with the other hand he, he'd readjust the capo so he could play the next chord. But the really great thing about the songs was this unbelievable continuous flow of just amazing lyrics. One song after another was, was filled with uh, magical imagery, cars and urban life, going down to Brighton with the guys on a weekend, others with forests and wizards and pixies and elves. Uh, after an hour, I was entranced. Walking in the woods one day, I met a man who said he was magic, wonderful things he said. Wanted hat upon his head. And that's the first Mark Boland single released by Decker in November 1965, The Wizard. It wasn't a hit, even though the enemy praised the most intriguing lyric and Boland's Sonny Bono-like voice. Mark actually performed that month on Ready Steady Go on the same show as the wicked Wilson Pickett, among others. In fact, the show's producer, Vicky Wickham, told me the other day she remembers him well. She says Mark was the only artist who ever shook her hand and thanked her for having him on the show. 
In those struggling days, Mark got to know someone else who just made a professional name change from Jones. Their paths would be intertwined for the rest of Mark's life. David Bowie. The first time I met Mark Bolan was uh, uh, an ex-manager's uh, office when we'd both been given the job of uh, painting his office. Okay. So we were slapping white... So it was me and Mark Bolan, so both, like, being very trendy mods, hanging up our jackets and, like, making sure the paint didn't go over our shirts. This must have been, oh, it's got to have been 65. And Mark and I got on extremely well. And at that point, he was uh, one of the first people to show me how to rescue wardrobes out of the dustbins of Carnaby Street and King's Road. Because at that time, there was such a lot of money flying about in uh, fashion that rather than sell damaged goods, the shops would put out shirts and trousers if there was the slightest tear in the trouser or if a couple of buttons were missing on the shirts. So you only had to wait until about 8 o'clock in the evening. And you could go up and down the King's Road through the dustbins outside the shops and you'd have a full wardrobe by the end of the night. So um, I, I always had a lot of gratitude in my heart for Mark to show me how to dress. And he, he, of course, at that time was King Mod. He was really the mod. And I was also a bit of a mod, I suppose. By the time Mark met his old school friend Richard Young again, he was moving in distinguished company, sartorially speaking at least. I went to work in Sportique, which to me was the kind of the most incredible place one could ever want to work. And the people that came in there, you had all your rock stars, you had Mick Jagger, you had Bob Dylan came in and bought stuff when he was over with the band. Artists, David Hockney, John Huston, the film director, all kinds of people came into the store to buy these fantastic clothes. And um, I hadn't seen Mark maybe in two years. And Mark came into the store and bought some clothes. And um, he was always charging it to somebody. I don't know who he was charging it to. Boland's subsequent singles, The Third Degree and Hippie Gumbo, both missed the charts as well. And by 1967, Simon Napier-Bell was having a bit of a rethink. So, not sure what to do with him. I, I persuaded him eventually to join my group, John's Children, who were beginning to get a lot of publicity and looked like they were going to happen very big. They were a four-piece rock group, so we threw out the guitarist and put Mark in instead. I had the idea that Andy, who was the lead singer, he'd continue to sing the songs, but Mark could do the backing vocals. Then the public would get used to his voice singing along in the background, and after a couple of hits with John Children, he could leave and he'd have a ready-made public. It was a great theory, but a complete flop, because in the end, John's Children never got those big hits. Replacing Seen and Heard this week, we have a special feature on pop lyrics by John Peel. In the defunct group John's Children and Desdemona, it was thought that the line, lift up your skirt and fly, was overtly sexual, and the record was not played on the air by anyone. In Australia, where they are presumably less sensitive, it was a bestseller. In late 67, Tony Visconti was a young would-be record producer about town in London, just off the boat, or the plane anyway, from New York, working for Denny Cordell's Straight Ahead Productions, which came out via EMI's Regal Zonophone label. I looked in the newspaper called the IT International Times, and right around the corner in, in a club we had on Tottenham Court Road was a uh, band called Tyrannosaurus Rex, and I had seen their name repeatedly, and I thought, okay, it sounds interesting, and I expected to see a, a huge rock group, you know, it was a big name, and uh, when I went down there, it was actually a very little group, it was a duo, and uh, Mark Bolin was a very diminutive person playing an acoustic guitar, but the thing that amazed me was there were about 300 people listening to him, they were very, very quiet, they were very hushed, hanging on to his every word, which I couldn't understand. Uh, I thought he was singing in French or something, or, or Gaelic, I don't know, it was a very exotic, uh, he had a very exotic way of singing and pronouncing words. So I went up to him after the set and I presented him with my business card and I said, I'd like to produce you. And he said, uh, you're the eighth record producer that came to see us this week. John Lennon was here last night, by the way, and he's going to produce us. So I said, oh, uh, all right, okay, well, I guess that's it. Well, nice meeting you and I really enjoyed it. And as I turned to leave, he goes, wait, let me have your card. <laughs> So I realized later on that was the first lie that Mark Boland had ever told me. Yeah. 
From the spring of 68, the original release of Deborah by the newly coined Tyrannosaurus Rex, featuring Mark Bolan and Steve Peregrine Took. It was a top 40 entry, but it went top 10 when it was reissued four years later during T-Rex mania. Meanwhile, as Tony remembers, the group's media supporters amounted to precisely one person and his show called The Perfumed Garden. For about a year or two, John Peel was the only BBC disc jockey playing Tyrannosaurus Rex. The other DJs would joke about the name that they, it was impossible to pronounce. And they said, uh, you know, Mark sounds like a chipmunk and things like that. They, you know, he just got a raw deal from them. But John Peel was the champion. He was great. Two of my favorite people in the whole world and two of my favorite musicians are the two people who make up Tyrannosaurus Rex. Jimmy Young suggested on the radio the other day that I was Tyrannosaurus Rex. And uh, if he's listening this evening, he's really going to appreciate this next trick because... Uh, both, I'll be talking with two voices simultaneously. And uh, a lot of people seem to think they have some curious uh, financial connection with the group or something, but that, of course, is not so at all. Well, once or twice a week, Mark comes round to festive Peel Acres, and we sit there and uh, listen to old Ricky Nelson records so that we can hear the guitar playing of James Burton, and we listen to Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent and early Elvis Presley things. Um, Mark going through his second childhood me through my third or fourth. I introduced him to um, Peter Jenner and Andrew King, who were uh, co-partners in a company that managed the Pink Floyd. And uh, June Bolin was their secretary, and that's how they met. So Mark went to their offices, got signed up, and uh, gigs started to come in. And when, when a phone call for a gig came in, you know, Peter or Andrew would answer the phone. And Mark was there one day when a gig came in for 50 pounds. And he heard Peter Jenner say, yeah, we'll take it. And he pulled the phone out of Peter Jenner's hand. And he says, no, we won't take it. Tyrannosaurus Rex goes for 100 quid a night. And he got it. The promoter said, okay, because there was a buzz. The record was out. Things were happening. And uh, he really had a, a feeling of self-worth. And from Pink Floyd, their late keyboard player, Rick Wrights, and first, David Gilmore. I know exactly how I met him, because he used to come into our office in Notting Hill Gate because he was romancing and flirting with our secretary, June Child, who he married. He'd be sitting on the floor of our office strumming his guitar. So he seemed to be very much in adoration of Sid. He loosely modelled himself on Sid. We did a lot of gigs together with the, uh, you know, with the old original Tyrannosaurus Rex and Steve Took and, and him. What he was doing at the time, no one else is singing like this, no one else is writing these kind of songs. I have a feeling that actually he adored Sid Barrett and actually was influenced by Sid. There's a similar feeling of poetry about their lyrics, exactly. isn't there? Exactly, yeah. There's definitely a connection between Mark Bowler and Sid Barrett. <laughs> Here's Mark Patras. There was no better looking British hippie in the psychedelic period apart from Sid Barrett, who Bolan idolised as well. The Bolan and Barrett both symbolised this perfect English, you know, straight out of um, some book of fairy tales. I mean, they dressed in their dreams. Single success for Tyrannosaurus Rex was patchy, but they made the top 20 of the album chart in 1968 with the extravagantly titled My People Were Fair and Had Sky in Their Hair, But Now They're Content to Wear Stars on Their Brows. Here's a very personal bowler memory from this era by Bernie Torpin. I probably met Mark through Elton. I just loved the ballsy kind of attitude that Mark had. He really believed he was a star. As we all know, he had these sort of Tolkien kind of elements to him. And because obviously I was a writer, he had these books made for me. They were a set of like four books 
and they were handmade. They were almost looked like they'd been made by elves, you know, or gnomes. They had wooden covers to them, and they were sort of like church door shaped covers, and very thick, about an inch thick, with sort of red and blue ribbon around them, sort of tacked in with little nails. And they were on sort of parchment paper, and I think it was sort of poetry that he'd written. And they were very sort of childish. Well, you know how his lyrics were crumbling spires and what have you. And they were just so charming, so charming. Yeah, he was a delightful young man. Further album chart entries arrived with Unicorn and A Beard of Stars. And then came the moment when Tyrannosaurus Rex morphed into T Rex. Tony Visconti. We were making the T-Rex album that Ride a White Swan came out of those sessions and we were still making the album when we released the song. It charted while we were in the studio. We would go in the, to Cranks and just put our change together and, and buy some communal food to eat and all that. And that was one of those days when we heard it was number two in the charts. Ride it all out like a bird in the sky was riding it all out like you were a bird Fly it all out like an eagle in a sunbeam Ride it all out like you were a bird And the record that kept Rider White Swan at number two in the UK charts in January 1971, Granddad by Clive Dunn. In the week the NME ran their first feature on Mark Boland, written by Nick Logan, the music paper that we think of as cutting edge at all times had Corporal Jones on the cover. Oh, and Andy Williams as well. Mark didn't care, though. He was on his way at last. Here's his biographer, Mark Patris. When Boland got the formula in 1970, it was very much dressed up 50s rock and roll, but then given this sort of Hollywood sheen on top, with also the dressings of sort of a psychedelic unisex look. The fact that it was based on the 50s values in many ways alienated Boland's old audience, and it was seen as a sellout by going back to three-minute songs based on rock and roll. She's my woman of gold, she's not very old, uh-huh. She's my woman of gold, she's not very old, uh-huh. I don't mean to be bold, but to me I hold your hand. First number one in the summer of 71, Hot Love. So, after all those years of toil, Mark Boland could finally say, made it ma, top of the world. Then the hits really started to flow, and they still stand up today. Here's David Gilmore. Get It On was on the radio this morning, and that's a killer backing track. It's a really, it's so good. I mean, it really has got a fantastic groove. It's just, it's a really good record.
it on. T-Rex with Mark Boland backed by Steve Curry on bass, Mickey Finn on percussion and Bill Legend on drums. And backing vocals there by Howard Kalen and Mark Volman from the Turtles. Not just a UK number one, it became an international calling card and a top ten single in the States under the name Banger Gong. By now the pensive cross-legged audience for the old group had been completely replaced by hordes of screaming girls as t rex was born. And we have a little feature here to illustrate that, based on a recording from the personal archive of a certain Radio 2 presenter who compared the T-Rex tour of autumn 1971. Take a listen. And now, sounds of the 70s disc jockey Bob Harris, who compared the recent T-Rex tour, talks to Mark Bolan and tells us what the tour was all about. <laughs> I've come out the front door very temporarily at the uh, Newcastle City Hall to speak with some of the people who saw the concert tonight. Did you enjoy it? My boy, it was lovely. It was fantastic. He was gentle and pretty, and I loved the way he sat there and crossed legs oh, no, singing that lovely song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you were on the tour too, Bob, and you can I mean, we, it was certainly a shock, wasn't it? We, mm. it, it came an, immediately as a shock, but I think we expected it. You know, we expected the people um, to be more involved. You slice so good With bones so fair You've got the universe Reclining in your hair Cause you're my baby Yes, you're my love Oh, girl, I'm just a dreamster For your love So, ladies and gentlemen, the compare of the T-Rex tour of Bob Harris. Yes, <laughs> um, yes apologies for the uh, for the interviewing technique in those days. <laughs> Braving the, uh, the fans. And uh, listening to it back, Paul, it's amazing because I had a Ewer tape machine yeah. with me. And I just carried it round the tour with me. And I did that interview with Mark on about the third or fourth gig. We were just absolutely blown away by the reaction. I'd met up with Mark when I first met John Peel in 1967. I went over to John's flat, as was then in Fulham, to do an interview with him for uh, Unit magazine. Uh, Tony Elliott was the editor. And we then, he and I, went on to co-found Time Out and John was very you know kind of involved with the whole underground scene in London at that point anyway and I really wanted to meet him because of the Perfume Garden and in those days if John did anything he insisted that Mark was with him because he was promoting Tyrannosaurus Rex and wanted to introduce them to sort of as wide a, an audience as possible so if John did an interview Mark was always there so I met John and I I met Mark for the first time. This is probably towards the end of the summer, early autumn in 1967. And that's when my friendship with Mark began. I was comparing that first t rex to see tour. That was the moment that that word was coined. And the first gig on the tour was at Portsmouth. It was at the Guildhall in Portsmouth. Rider White Swan had already been a hit by now. I think Hot Love was still at number one or just coming off number one. Jeepster was in the charts. You know, they couldn't have been hotter, really. Mm. But even so, we had absolutely no idea what was going to happen. I mean, we got to Portsmouth like you do, you know, sound check. There were quite a few people outside. The concert itself was just, you couldn't hardly hear a, a note because of the screaming. I always used to drive around with him so when we left I was right by his side and the first thing that I realized was the scissors the flashes of, of <laughs> stainless steel coming to try and get locks of Mark's hair and because Mark was just a bit smaller than me all these things were flashing right at eye level you know there, there was a police cordon to try and keep the crowds back to get us to the car people were breaking through the cordon they were ripping at Mark's clothes and the motorcade were five old gas guzzling Vauxhall Cresters and everything on the outside of these cars was getting sort of ripped off the windscreen wipers the number plates in fact three of those five cars were written off that night because the weight of people on the roof and uh, you know on the bonnets and everything else and you're edging forward through the crowd with faces up against the window and pandemonium outside and I remember sitting there with Mark and he got a pink feather boa <laughs> round his shoulders and the, I've never seen an expression 
you know, on his face. He had this look of you know, excitement. He was slightly scary as well, but a preening kind of whoa kind of, <laughs> you know, look on his face as all these girls were just, just trying to rip the car to bits to try and get at him. It was really incredible. I'd never experienced anything like it. Then into Mark Bowen's life came a soul singer and composer called Gloria Jones. In the early 70s, she was a writer at Motown with Pam Sawyer. They wrote for Marvin Gaye, Gladys Knight and the Pips and the Commodores. But in the mid-1960s, Gloria had recorded the original of a song that would come back to life much later in the hands of Soft Cell. It's to you. And I was playing the piano and singing when he made his entrance. And he kind of looked as if to say, you know, why didn't she stop? She doesn't realize I've just entered here. You know, I just continue to sing. <laughs> but finally I got up and, and we met. Then I later saw him a few years after that. But during this time, he was married, I was married. So we actually were friends. And I was his background singer. Now, we were friends for over one year before we actually became involved. Mark was breaking in America. So we were traveling in the South quite a lot. And my father was very concerned because we were an interracial couple. And it really wasn't as comfortable or popular as it is now. I said, oh, Dad, don't worry about that because Mark would have the glitter, the boa, the mascara, the bareback shoes. And I said, they think it's just two girls walking through the airport. By 1972, Bolan was living the rock and roll life with all the usual excesses and indulging in a little self-congratulation in this BBC interview of the time. To what do you attribute your success, Mark? I mean, apart from hard work, but what I just else? think time and good luck and four years of groundwork. In thinking of the single, the metal guru, yeah. I find that uh, this, this has a depth and a quality. I just wanted to find out what you thought of it. Well, I mean, that's sort of the indication of what the album's like. It's much bigger sound. The overall thing is, is much bigger. One fortunate thing about being successful is people always think they've got you bad, you know? And they always do, in doing that, they tend to underestimate you. And it's nice to be underestimated when you, you know the musical boundaries that you put on yourself are far greater. You would write a song like Children of the Revolution and you would mean it as well. I think the proof is in the pudding that when punk came five years later, Susie and all those people who were putting on all this very, very strange makeup, they were the children of Boland's Revolution.
Those of us who were listening to Pick Up The Pops on a Sunday afternoon the first time around remember it like this. Wow! That's the way it came in. Straight to number 40 this week in the Pick Up The Pops Top 20, T-Rex and Children of the Revolution. Our beloved Fluff Freeman there. And this is a revised repeat of 20th Century Boy, an appreciation of Mark Bolan on Radio 2. I'm Paul Sexton. Here's Mark's brother, Harry Feld. When I used to go and visit him, it was uh, after the 70s had started. He'd say, just lay down a tape, listen to it and tell me what you think about it. If I said it was great, he said, right, that's another one for the cupboard. Because if you like it, it's not commercial. But the signs of self-indulgence were beginning to show, especially in a movie that Mark made with Ringo Starr called Born to Boogie. Here's Bernie Taupin. I watched that just recently. It's appalling. I mean, the, the, the footage of him performing is, is OK, but all of the other stuff is just... Oh, it's torturous. I mean, it's just so self-indulgent and so... You know, trying to be arty and clever. And there's one segment of, like, him trying to say something and start cracking up laughing. And it goes, you know, they keep trying to do it again and again and again. And it's like, OK, joke's over. <laughs> edit, edit. <laughs> Some people like to roll. <laughs> Give us a chance. Some people like to roll. They do, they do, honest. They really, really do. They love to roll all over the floor. <laughs> Once more. <clears throat> Once more with feeling, it. Come on now, people. Some people like... <laughs> Come on, now. We're running out of film. <laughs> the light's going. One of Boland's fellow chart stars of the early 70s with Wizard and his solo hits, Roy Wood. In the earlier days when he had Tyrannosaurus Rex going, we, we used to do quite a lot of uh, festivals with him, uh, you know, in, in Europe and that. I met him in later times when T-Rex were going and we used to be on the same TV programmes a lot together, you know. He was all right and there's a couple of times when my band had gone back to Birmingham and I was in London on my own and that and we used to go out together and have a few drinks and that and uh, this one night he introduced me to a vodka teeny which is like vodka with martini as the mixer and it was it was pretty uh, you know lethal stuff so we got a bit of that down us and we ended up going back to Mark's place and uh, I was well, absolutely three sheets to the wind to be perfectly honest with you and uh, got a couple of guitars out I was showing him how to play a couple of bits you know and and this and we were just having a bit of a laugh and I couldn't even see the guitar let alone play it. He is an avowed modern day Boland fan, Noel Gallagher. I had a cassette tape and it had on it. I used to carry it everywhere with me when Oasis was just starting. It was a C90 and it had in order it had two songs of Mark Boland, two songs of David Bowie and two songs of Slade repeated for an hour and a half. That's why I got all that thing from was from T-Rex and that era, like 70, 71 to 74 thing. They've got that run of singles that David Bowie's got, that Slade have got, that all come out week after week after week. I heard 20th Century Boy two weeks ago on the radio and you can still almost reach out and touch that record. Do you know what I mean? You can still hear the party going on in the studio if you listen to it on headphones and it still sounds like it was recorded yesterday. I don't know anybody that doesn't like it. It's amazing when you're at a party and T-Rex tunes comes on. It's real party music. It's not... Like David Bowie, when you listen to the words, it kind of says more about you, do you know what I mean, in the way you perceive it, whereas T-Rex and Slade, for that matter, is out and out party music, which is why they were such great rivals. You put T-Rex and out a party, and there's nobody going to the kitchen to get, to get a drink, they're all having a dance, you know? <laughs> was the single that ended T-Rex's run of 11 top 10 UK hits in a row from late 1973, Truck on Tyke. Some cracks were beginning to show. Here's Harry Feld. 
I don't think the success changed him. It was the hangers-on that changed him. It, it was the, the aggravation all the time. Because he used to say, look, it's a business, but my business is music. Let me do the music, and I employ people to do accounting, driving, or whatever you've got to do in that trade. And it's a very stressful job doing what he was doing. And Mark Patras. I mean, as soon as the record started going, not in at number one, but, you know, number two and three, straight away, people couldn't wait to start kicking into Bowling. You know, at that time, Bowie was there waiting in the wings to really take over. And that's another story as well, the rivalry between those two. He celebrated his fame with cognac, cocaine, champagne, started piling on the pounds. And for a small man, you know, straight away, he was the porky pixie and all this kind of, you know, glittering chipolata, they called him, I think. Oh, God, were we competitive. And it was about staying out of each other's way but also trying to suss out what the other one was up to. So it was sort of, we circled each other. We, we always liked each other, you know, because we got on well. Then we had this sparring point over the late 60s, early 70s. Once he was really making lots of money, he was very, very impatient, very arrogant, and could be very abusive to the, to the members of the band. And sometimes to me, I noticed he'd take it out on the roadies, the band members, and he'd avoid me, but... Every now and then, I think, once a year, he'd explode. And one time, it was because I told him his guitar was out of tune. And there happened to be two girls in the room, two groupies, you know. And you're not supposed to say anything was wrong with him in front of anyone outside of the inner circle, you know. Things like that. And also the fact that he uh, continued to pay his band only 75 pounds a week right until the very end. When um, we made uh, Zinc Alloy during that album, that was the first album, believe it or not, where cocaine it was a regular feature in the studio. And Mark used to be really out of his head. And, you know, when you use cocaine, then there's, a, there's the inevitable bottle of alcohol comes up. So it's a messy album. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of spirit. There's a lot of funny things happening on the album, you know. But it's very ragged and very, very, you know, well, it wasn't a commercial success. Although he want, that was his album that he was making one more for the kids. It was some kind of a, a pub album in, in many ways. So that was really sad, a very sad end to our relationship. And I left after that. Alan Edwards has long been one of the leading publicists in entertainment PR, but back in the mid-70s, he was just out of school and working on Mark's press for the top publicist of those days, Keith Altham. Alan remembers that Boland did things with a bit of style, even after he took a bit of a commercial dip. He'd always turn up at the front door in this fantastic Rolls Royce and get out of it wearing glittering clothes and it'd be sort of a dark you know, grey Monday afternoon, the roll would pull up, Mark would jump out, steam straight into the interviews, and he was a star. I mean, the copy that he gave, the quotes and everything was was, was incredible. And I always wondered about this car. I thought, well, yeah, Mark must be absolutely, you know, poor, the money must be pouring in and this, that and the other. And what I found out was it was a, it was a friend of his who had a deal with the company, and they used to just park around the back of the office and drive the 100 yards round. So, so it would always look great in front of the media. He really understood understood PR in the in the best and deepest sense of the word. I think the only time that it got him down was the mid-70s, and I think it's happened to all stars. They get a, a blank period where their career seems to be not going up at all, it's just following a flat line. But um, he picked it himself up and uh, he got himself a television programme, and uh, he's, he was on the way up, I'm not saying right to the top, but it, he was building his career up again and getting a new following. Mark appeared on Mike Mansfield's new Saturday afternoon pop show called Supersonic. That eventually led to his own series, the one Harry mentioned. More of that shortly. But in 1975, he had a new son and a new hit. Here's Noel Gallagher. I've never got to the bottom of... Have you ever seen a woman coming out in New York City with a frog in her hand? And the answer to that would be no. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> Gloria Jones again. I think Mark knew his destiny. I think he knew who would be in his life. But 
he said the one thing that he never, never expected was to have his son. And oh, he was so happy. We love to boogie. We love to boogie. Jitterbug boogie. Bowling pilly boogie. We love to boogie on a Saturday night. Belinda Miff in the sky, the Cadillac bone. Jamie lost a cherry walking all the way home. The passion of the earth blasted his mind. By the summer of 1977, Bolan was beginning a new music series of his own called Mark, which featured up-and-coming acts like The Jam and Generation X. And on what turned out to be the last edition, a light-heartedly shambolic duet with his friend and rival of the past decade and more, David Bowie. One, two, three, yeah! became firm, firm friends again up until his death. The last few years in the 70s, we got incredibly staunch friends. I mean, Mark was probably my best friend at that particular time up until he died. He was such a great guy. And uh, it was such a tragedy. Really, really knocked me sideways when that happened. But it was a great, you know, we had a great relationship. He was, he was a lot of fun, a very witty, funny man, full of charm, incredibly arrogant. But most enchantingly arrogant, most acceptable. Well, that's the end of another show. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back soon. Remember, keep a little mark in your heart and we'll be back the same mark time, same mark channel. On September the 16th, 1977, Gloria and Mark were on their way back from a meal with friends at Morton's Restaurant. Gloria driving her 1275 GT Mini. As we know all too well, they never made it home. The car crashed into a tree on Barnes Common, killing Mark and leaving Gloria critically ill. Here's Roland Bolan. I think his life changed when I kind of came into it, and then all of a sudden, boom, the accident, and here we are, you know? So many people, when they talk about their dad to me, they don't remember that he was my dad, you know? They talk to him at, about Mark Boland from T-Rex, not realizing that I lost my father. And then usually until someone else loses their father, then they go, oh, Roland, I totally understand how you feel now. Roland was raised as a, a normal child. His father's pictures were there, the materials were there. He was allowed to touch anything that he wanted of his dad. But he was not raised like, you know, you are the son of a rock star, blah, 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 blah. And, and the reason that I did that, because I really wanted him to have his own individuality and also to have a chance to be normal. It's very strange because I was born in England but raised in L.A., but no one really knew who T-Rex was over here. It's different, so it gave me a chance to kind of find my own self. But then when I went back for the 20th anniversary, that's when I became Roland Boland and not just Roland Seymour Feld, you know. And I had the records, I had the music, and until um, Def Leppard had the Rocket video, that was the first time in my life because they had a clip of Get It On, the video, or Bang a Gong. And basically, that was the first time in my life I saw my dad move, and I would wake up every morning just to see that, you know. Bolan's kind of had a bit of a, a rum deal of it since his death in some ways because he's always been associated with glam rock and I think he's more than that. Glam rock is also a kind of a, a, a the sort of more trashier end of, of pop genres and I would argue that Bolan really is a kind of a transcendent trash in some ways. The timelessness of his songs and his work uh, and the productions really seems to be much more apparent. So you've got people from Devendra Bernhardt at one level you've got the fratellis you've got you know oasis a few years ago people taking different elements of boland's sound and style here's noel gallagher again uh, he wants to admit something well of course we nick the riff of get it on wholesale for cigarettes and alcohol i never got sued which makes me think that he must have nicked it off one-legged blind dog willie mcjackson yeah, from right. from the delta somewhere so People always said, oh, you've nicked that riff, and it's like, yeah, but where did he get it from, I wonder? Tony Visconti. Shortly before he died, we did see each other. We threw our arms around each other, and we hugged and made up, and, you know, it was, there was not, e not even a, a discussion about what happened, you know. Uh, I remember holding his son Roland in my arms, and we, we could have gotten together. Oh, Mark would have loved the internet, although he was a little dyslexic. I would have, it would have been interesting to see a Mark Bolin email. All misspelt words, K's instead of C's and things like that. Alan Edwards. 
There was two or three people, you know, I've seen America, you had that whole thing going with the New York Dolls, Alice Cooper, you know, there was a whole period there. But in, in Britain, there were absolutely two stalwarts, and it, it was with, without doubt Mark and David, you know. Um, and they were, of course, very, very good friends as well. Um, and they, they changed not only, you know, a lot of music, but they changed sexual attitudes and, and, and the whole thing. And it was cool and camp. It was cool to be camp. It was great to wear makeup. There was nothing to feel awkward about. And I know so many people that were liberated by that living in maybe provincial towns where you were going to get beaten up on a Saturday night if you had a hint of mascara on now every bloke down the pub was dressing up with Mark sort of curly black hairdos or you know sort of dark eye patches or whatever and it was um, you know Mark and, and David completely pioneered that and changed perceptions and Bob Harris again with the benefit of hindsight you look back now and the music that Mark was making in 71, 72, 73 it's fantastic and it stood the test of time and what's more you know it's been a big influence to a whole succession of musicians that, that have followed not least Nirvana, Kurt Cobain and even, you know, a few years ago, I remember seeing Robbie Williams on Top of the Pops wearing a Mark Boland T-shirt. Mm. So he's still kind of there with everything. And I think <laughs> that of all things, that would be what would give Mark the greatest pleasure to think that those records of his now, you know, they're still influential and they're still regarded as great records. I think that he would see as a fantastic legacy. I always wanted to be a teenage idol. I think every person wants to be. It's lovely to be worshipped and all that, as long as it's real. 20th Century Boy, an appreciation of Mark Bolan, was written and produced by me, Paul Sexton. It was a wise bit of production for Radio 2.